Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Space Warfighter Talks. I'm your host, Bill Wolf, the president and founder of the Space Force Association. We are honored to have with us today Lieutenant General Stephen Whiting, the commander of the Space Operations Command. Sir, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for what the Space Force Association is doing. And sir, before we get started, I would like to thank our individual and our corporate members, especially our sponsor member, SAIC. Hello, my name is John Big Dog Roan, a proud 24-year veteran of the United States Air Force. I've loved having a front row seat to watching all that our military has been able to accomplish over the past 24 years. That includes witnessing the birth of the United States Space Force. On behalf of SAIC, I want to wish you a happy first birthday. We look forward to being able to grow and innovate right alongside you over the next year, five years, 24 years. Happy birthday, Semper Supra. Sir, before we get started, do you have any opening comments you'd like to talk about just from a the Spock perspective? Hey, it's uh, really, again, a privilege to be here. And uh, thanks for that shout out from SAIC about our birthday. Uh, we are right in the midst of uh, the birthday uh, week here. Uh, I, I've been joking. We're kind of like the Queen of England. We have our actual birthday. We have our observed birthday. You know, uh, when your birthday is the 20th of December, it's hard to get the the masses together, uh, especially with COVID, because so many people are are starting their leave or, or whatnot. So we we really celebrated that on Friday, both uh, globally with Space Force on a, a virtual call like this one. That absolutely was phenomenal with the Secretary of the Air Force and our Chief of Space Operations, as well as deployed members from uh, Africa, from uh, the Middle East, from uh, Europe, and uh, and from uh, Asia. It was fantastic. Um, and then we also did some celebrations here. And of course, celebrations are fun, but they really recognize uh, all the work that's gone in the last year to stand up the Space Force. And just here over the last uh, less than two months uh, to stand up uh, Space Operations Command, the first field command, the uh, Fight Tonight Force for uh, United States Space Force and the largest service component to US Space Command. So I look forward to talking about those issues with you and the team today, Bill. Great, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I'm gonna compliment you a lot today. It's only because you've had a phenomenal career. And, uh, and we're gonna talk a lot about uh, what you've done and what has led you to be able to lead this new organization and get the Space Force ready to provide space warfighting effects to combatant commands. And so with that, sir, U.S. Air Force Academy 1989 distinguished graduate with a degree in aeronautical engineering. How important was it for you personally to have a STEM degree as a young space professional? And what would you say to the 12 year old aspiring space professional or even the space curious about their education as they prepare for a future in the greater U.S. space enterprise? Yeah, so for me, I, I love uh, science, technology, math, engineering. And so I did pursue an engineering degree. To this day, I kick myself that I went down the aeronautical engineering path, learned all about airplanes and how to design them and then pursued a career in space operations. So I wish I had done an astronautical engineering degree uh, like uh, like uh, some others, uh, that's a challenging degree. And you know, for me, it's been very helpful, not because I remember the equations, I don't. It's, I, I've forgotten more than I probably ever learned, but it's a systematic way of thinking that's been very helpful for me. And I'm comfortable with numbers and with rates and, and quickly trying to judge scales of things. And that's been tremendously helpful. Now, I know over the last several years, we've tried to make all of our space operators STEM cognizant, but you know what? We have some great space operators who have degrees in the arts and the humanities. And for those space operators, I would say, uh, hey, your degrees have taught you uh, how to think in a certain way as well. Bring that uh, to us because that gives us diversity of thought and, uh, and we need your perspective as well. To that young 12 year old out there first, I, I hope you are inspired by space. We are truly in the second golden age of space. Now I was alive, I was less than two when uh, Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon. So I don't remember that first golden age, but I do remember being inspired by the space shuttle. Uh, I vaguely remember being inspired by the space lab when we did that link up with the Soyuz. But today, every, uh, every week we can watch some uh, first of kind launch or landing when a rocket comes back to land and it, it is inspiring and for those young boys and girls out there uh, 
do pursue your math and science education. Uh, start start uh, on your own time uh, learning about computers and robotics. Those are all things we care about in Space Force, and, and those kind of skills will will uh, best position you to join us one day if that's what you aspire to do. Thank you, sir. I know there's a lot of excited kids out there right now talking about and thinking about how to join the Space Force in the future. And again, sir, you've had a, a tremendous career and you continue to have a phenomenal career. You're the top graduate and distinguished graduate from nearly every academic program, an executive officer, special assistant, and a commander at all levels. On paper, you've never made a mistake. You were also brought up in a risk averse culture of Air Force Space Command as were your subordinate commanders. What don't we see on your record which prepares you to lead an organization which intends to push risk acceptance to the lowest possible level? And what is your approach to leading subordinates who accept smart risk, but still fall on the wrong side of the probability distribution? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a self-reflective question. Um, you know, I've had, uh, some personal failure in my own career. Uh, I started out wanting to be a pilot, went to pilot training, and that did not work out. And soul-crushing disappointment at the time. Uh, for those who went through the Air Force Academy in the, the mid-80s, that's what it was all about, was producing pilots. Uh, but the Air Force didn't give up on me, and I fell on my feet in the space business and have had nothing but a fantastic, uh, uh, you know, fantastic opportunities, doors have opened, and I've just loved every minute of it, but it's because no, uh, somebody didn't give up on me. And so uh, we want to make sure that everyone in our Space Force has a chance to contribute and take risk. Now, we have to take risks smartly. We didn't come to this cultural place where we are risk adverse uh, for no reason. Now, they're not all good reasons, but we came here for a reason. One would be that uh, there's kind of two streams of our history. One is the science and technology stream that every launch from about 1957 in Sputnik, uh, and you could even go farther back, but up through probably the late 60s, early 70s, was a hand-built wooden shoe, hundreds of millions of dollars on, of the rocket. Every payload was a hand-built uh, payload, and those were hundreds of millions of dollars. And so we didn't want to blow those up, and we blew a lot of them up early. And so there did become a lot of risk aversion there. And then in the mid uh, early 90s, I think it was 1993, we merged our space operations career field with the ICBM career field. And that, that had advantages, and there were reasons that the Air Force chose to do that. But let's be honest, you don't want your young missile operators doing a lot of innovation and risk taking. We need them to be utterly disciplined so that we can assure the uh, president, our allies and potential adversaries that we're gonna operate uh, those systems in a certain way. So those two streams of history kind of brought us to where we are. Now, I will say, I think uh, over the last uh, really uh, 10 years, but intensifying over the last five years, we're trying to change that. Now, our young people have to believe us when they hear that. Um, I, we can point to a lot of things. Uh, first of all, um, I did have uh, experience of two years serving at the Air Force uh, Warfare Center at Nellis, where you know it really was helpful for me to see how the rest of the Air Force in some things doesn't major in the minors. And we had a history of doing that one in this risk adverse culture, we would major in the minors and really is trying to take a step back and look at the overall mission impact of certain activities. And you know what, just because uh, you, uh, you uh, maybe uh, do something out of order or um, something doesn't go exactly uh, as you planned it, if the overall mission hasn't been impacted, uh, boy, let's learn from that and move forward and let's don't uh, take people out back and uh, take them to the woodshed. And I think we've made some very positive steps. We have more to do. Uh, we have to continue to empower our young people and, and make them believe that these words that our CSO, John Raymond and others, uh, myself included, are saying are, are actually actually real. I hope that got after your question, Bill. Yes, sir, it sure does. And, and of course, you bring up the Warfare Center where we spent a little bit of time working together. And I remember the uh, brown bag lunches. Remember the space brown bag lunches you used to host? You said, hey, we have some space folks here at Nellis. Let's get together on a regular basis and talk about how we can innovate. So I remember that that left a lasting impression on me personally, and I really appreciate your leadership there. And really gets to the point of, you know, fail fast, debrief. And, and then, and we're going to get to this here in a second about the development of the testing process, uh, tactics development and training and the importance of that. So yes, sir, that does answer the question. And sir, as the spot commander, you're the first U.S. Space Force service component commander to U.S. Spacecom. What are your priorities as the inaugural spot commander to enable future spot commanders to exercise their role? 
Well, it's very humbling to be here as a plank holder to steal our Navy uh, brothers and sisters term uh, of this new organization. We've stood up a lot of new organizations in the last several years as space is now, uh, I think, getting to the end state of where we need to be. And that is we have a combatant command, U.S. Space Command. Uh, totally uh, focused on space war fighting. And now we have a service whose only job is to uh, every day prepare uh, space professionals to think about the space domain and to execute the whole uh, plethora of missions that we have in space. So to be at the nexus of those two organizations in Spock is truly an exciting uh, opportunity because we are the fight tonight force for US Space Force. And as such, we are the service component to U.S. Space Command. So you asked about our priorities. Uh, I would say that at Spock, we talk about our four P's, our four Papas. Number one is our mission to protect America and her allies in, from, and to space now and into the future. That highlights that, uh, that, that fact that we have to be ready now to protect America. We also have to have an eye out to the future on what is going to be required for us to protect America uh, and her allies now and into the future. So that's that's the first one, protect. And then we have three priorities that support that. Number one is to prepare. We talk about preparing Intel-led, cyber secure, space and combat support forces. And I like that, uh, that way of bringing it together because it highlights our core competencies, which are Intel, and we've brought in a number of units from Air Combat Command over the last several months that are now part of the Space Force. And of course, we're gonna have Intel professionals as you know, full, full members of the Space Force, they're gonna start transferring here and just the, uh, in fact, I think some of the enlisted ones have already started to transfer and then the officers will start transferring early next year. So Intel-led cyber secure, because we are, we are a series of global networks that must be secure uh, in our soft underbelly of cyber. And again, cyber professionals are, are a part of Space Force and uh, they are transferring now as well. Uh, and then we have space. So those are our operations uh, core competency and we have combat support forces. And those are the airmen largely on our bases and our garrisons and still at our two launch wings that do all those functions that you expect on an installation uh, such as uh, chaplains, medics, uh, uh, security forces, finance, you name it. We're gonna remain utterly dependent on them. So that's number two is where we prepare. Uh, our third, uh, third P is to partner. Uh, we are in a really in, uh, unique position here uh, in that we have to partner with a number of stakeholders across the US government and with allies. Uh, so our Five Eyes partners, uh, the Department of Commerce, FAA, uh, the NRO, all are critical to our mission. And so we do have a partnership uh, responsibility with them. And then we also, under this uh, priority highlight, that as the service component to US Space Command, we must be a, a fully engaged and active component for Headquarters U.S. Space Command. And then lastly, our last uh, priority and the fourth of the P's is that we project combat power uh, in, from, and to space. And we also have to project an innovative and digitized force. Um, and that's uh, you know, a couple of things that are supportive of General Raymond's uh, uh, priorities to get after being a digital space force. But those are our, our four uh, you know, mission and priorities. So it's protecting America, it's uh, preparing our forces, it's partnering with others, and it is, um, it is projecting uh, the combat power that we produce. Thank you, sir. Spock West is responsible to plan, integrate, conduct, and assess global space operations in order to deliver combat relevant space capabilities to the COCOMs, coalition, partners, the joint force, and the nation. That, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, there's, that's a tremendous responsibility. Can we dissect that a little bit? What roles do, you, do our coalition partners play in providing space capabilities? Yeah, if, if I could, I'd like to step back and talk a little bit about Spock West, because I think this is okay. a, a hard organization for people to understand. And then I'll, I'll get to your point about what are our uh, allied partners doing for us. First of all, uh, General, Major General Deanna Burt is the best person to talk to about uh, Spock West and CIFSIC. So I encourage you to do that here soon. But yes, um, I want to explain that headquarters. That used to be 14th Air Force. And that was a, an intermediate headquarters between the old Headquarters Air Force Space Command and its wings. And that was, a, that was a vertical chain of command, Headquarters Air Force Space Command, 14th Air Force, and then the wings. That is no longer the case. Um, because we're a Space Force now, we don't have organizations called the 14th Air Force in the Space Force. Uh, that organizational name has changed now, and it's called Spock West. They also are no longer an intermediate headquarters between Spock 
and our Deltas, Garrisons, and Wings. What they are out at Vandenberg, Spock West, is a presented headquarters whose only job as a staff is to be U.S. Space Command's Combined Force Space Component Command. So their job is to be a joint component each and every day and to not worry about service, organize, train, equip, generate, present, sustain type activities. Their job is to think about joint war fighting. Now, there's one person at Vandenberg who has to think about Spock, generate, present, and sustain activities, and that's General Burke. She's dual-hatted. She's the commander of SIFSEC, and she's my deputy on the Spock side. But other than that, her staff is only about joint war fighting and executing that task. So I wanted to set that up front so you, you understand it is not the old 14th Air Force of old, and I love that organization and had the honor to command it. And its history went all the way back to Claire Chennault, incredible history. But that's not that organization, but they, they are still inspired by that war fighting ethos that came to us from the Flying Tigers. So that's my preamble. Now let me get to your question of what are our partners doing? Because that C in CIFSIC is combined, combined force space component command. That implies international. And so uh, we, of course, um, uh, let me say U.S. Space Command, of course, has stood up a named operation for space. It's called Operation Olympic Defender. And the United Kingdom and Australia have publicly joined that operation. I think you'll hear other allies publicly speak about that in the near future. We'll wait for their, them to make their uh, public releases. But that means each and every day we're conducting combined operations in space. Now, those countries, uh, uh, UK and Australia, plus other close partners like Canada, uh, they actually contribute real capability. There are, there are sensors and systems that we've partnered with those countries to either uh, build or to operate or to man, and they give us that capability back so that we can, we can manage it as an enterprise and then we can all share the benefits of that information. So if you go out to Vandenberg, to the Combined Space Operations Center, which is the C2 node for CIFSIC, you will walk on the ops floor and it may very well be a squadron leader from the uh, Aust Royal Australian Air Force, uh, she is leading that crew because she is integrated at the, at the highest classification level, helping to run those, uh, those uh, operations. And you may go over and talk to the theater support desk and they may be managing space support requests for a Canadian frigate who's conducting operations in support of some activity somewhere. So we're very tightly integrated. We're integrated with their national space operations centers that are called the CAN-SPOC, the AUSPOC, the UK-SPOC. Then there's another level of allies on just outside of that. So we have those allies that work with us together inside the C-SPOC. And then there's allies who we partner with through an organization called the Combined Space uh, Combined Space Operations, CSPO, and those, this additional ring of allies would include France, Germany, and Japan. And we have uh, ways that we partner with them. Even in real time, they have LNOs, uh, liaison officers, who are assigned at Vandenberg to work alongside us and our joint partners there each and every day. And then there's another set of allies beyond that that we're starting to form relationships and talking about how do we liaise and partner better together. And maybe that's just signing a space situational awareness uh, sharing agreement, uh, but over time we want it to be really uh, taking advantage of their capability, allowing them to take advantage of ours, and by doing so we increase our overall capability and of course proving that we're stronger together. Very long-winded, I apologize for that, but hopefully that answered your question. Sir, it really does, and I appreciate the tasker to go interview Major General Burke, <laughs> so I accept that tasker as well. Sir, thanks for talking about the coalition and the importance of that partnership. Now let's focus a little bit on the joint services. And is there a opportunity for the joint services to have representation in the CSPOC or, or how is it? I remember, you know, back in the day, I, my job was to go out and integrate capability, space capabilities into the combatant commander's plans. And I would do that and, and just deploy out there and make sure they had that covered. How is that crosstalk taking place now? And do, does each service component have the opportunity to say, hey, this is what I need and make sure that we have that critical space capability to support those operations. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, let me start by talking about CIPSIC again. So out at the Combined Space Operations Center or CSPOC, the, the nucleus of that organization is presented by the US Space Force and its, its individual Space Force 
members and still some airmen who are sitting in our billets. But there are 45 or so joint billets that are laid atop that by US Space Command. And through those joint billets, we have uh, out there soldiers, we have sailors, we have Marines, we have some Air Force members, and we have some Space Force members all sitting in those joint billets. But they bring that joint perspective to General Burt and the SIFSEC as they're conducting operations. And of course, inside of US Space Command, which is a utterly joint organization with all the services represented, they have service components from not only the Space Force, but the Army, the Navy, and the Marines. And I know the US Air Force is off working a service component for the uh, US Space Command uh, for the air capabilities that are required to support uh, US Space Command. Stand by to hear more about that as the Air Force makes some decisions. But of course, uh, each of the services is represented through those uh, commands, and they have the ability to talk about what they need, what they can provide, what they can, uh, you know, uh, support with. So uh, I think the, the, the space community is, is very joint, uh, and, you know, I think will only continue to be so as we move forward. Thank you, sir. At, at, that clears it up uh, because, you know, it is a critical capability and that's what we expect is, you know, we're not just a, Space Force is not just a supporting function anymore, but you probably are going to see an opportunity for other service components to support your space domain superiority mission and how you train and, and prepare those forces to provide that capability. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, you know, we, we are all about creating space superiority. We cannot do that with Space Force capabilities alone. Um, and, and, and of course, all those operations will be conducted by U.S. Space Command. But that will be a multi-domain fight if we ever have to conduct uh, space, superior, pardon me, space superiority operations. Um, there will be an uh, on-orbit uh, layer to that. Uh, there'll be a terrestrial layer. We're going to need uh, the fires that can be brought to bear by all the other uh, services and components. Uh, just like, of course, any other type operation is uh, almost always multi-domain. Uh, space operations will be multi-domain as well. Thank you, sir. Part of the Spock vision that you spoke about is to develop an empowered, diverse warfighting culture. Can you explain how you as a commander intend to actively lay the foundation for a culture which is empowered and diverse? Yeah, let's talk a little bit about diversity up front. Uh, we have this really unique opportunity here uh, as we stand up a new service to be thinking about those things right from the beginning. And it's it's, it's uh, you know, challenging the assumptions are what are the right percentages of men to women? Uh, we've kind of, over the last 20, 30 years, kind of settled into a certain percentage. Is that the right percentage in a, in a much smaller force? Why couldn't we be closer to 50-50? Um, does our force look like America? And of course, the reason we want our force to look like America is because we believe that talent has been equally distributed uh, across this country, you know, irrespective of gender, race, religion, geographic location. And so we want to give all, we want to take advantage of all of those people and bring that talent in. And we think we'll be a better force. And so those are all the type questions that our uh, human uh, capital officer uh, and her team in the Pentagon are looking at as they're thinking about our, uh, our workforce development strategies and human capital development strategies. And so uh, we're excited about that. And given again, uh, our small size, um, you know, I think our recruiting can look uh, potentially more like headhunting uh, than uh, the other services that have to bring in tens of thousands, tens and tens of thousands of young women and men a year uh, will be at a different scale, which gives us, uh, I think, some unique opportunities. And then you talk about empowerment. Um, some of you may have seen that within the last month or so, General Raymond has issued his Chief of Space Operations Planning Guidance. And I tell you, that's a really quality document. And I encourage you all to read it if you want to know what General Raymond is driving across the Space Force. And there's a very interesting part in there that talks about empowerment and how we are going to uh, use uh, various command techniques. And one of them that he highlights is we will use command by negation. Uh, that is something that traditionally the Navy has been known for where you tell the next commander, unless otherwise directed, here's what I'm doing. And it's different than taking a decision brief uh, up where you're asking permission. And so that is something we are starting to use in, um, in Spock. It's something I'm using with General Raymond. Uh, it's something that my subordinate commanders are using with me. And, uh, and they come and tell me what they're planning to do unless I direct otherwise. And, and then, you know, we have to be smart. Some issues are outside of my portfolio and I need to go talk to others before I, I just start acting. But when a decision is within my portfolio, I uh, want to talk to all the right people, gather the facts, and then I'm going to move out and inform my boss and uh, let him, uh, you know, give me different guidance if he so chooses. So that's something we're trying to push down. Um, and by the way, our flat structure 
really is, is kind of forcing us into this because um, I, we, I can't micromanage all of that uh, force structure uh, given this flat, flat structure. And so if, if subordinate commanders ever wanted to be empowered, now is the time uh, because uh, we, we need them and they, ha they have to do it because we can't micromanage it for them. Yes, sir. And, and that uh, there's, I know there's been some questions from the community really, you know, how do you manage such a large organization? But going back to the war fighting culture just a little bit, and the reality is, is culture isn't, isn't built in a day. Uh, what can the junior and mid-career leaders look to from senior Space Force leaders as a guiding star for developing unit war fighting culture within developing, development of the U.S. Space Force war fighting culture? Well, first, uh, we trust you and you have a critical mission. And uh, I say that right up front. And then I'm going to say, we can't downward impose a culture. Now we can talk about, we want a warfighting culture. We can set conditions with all of the structures, with our organizational structure, with the awards we provide, with uh, the, the heroes we hold up. But ultimately, the, I believe the culture will be a bottoms up culture. And it's in those squadrons and in those space deltas and in those garrisons where the majority of our personnel, Space Force professionals and the airmen who will be assigned to us who are all critical that it's, it's at that level, at the squadron and Delta and garrison level, where they're going to spend the vast majority of their career. And it's in those places that we want to build, uh, you know, this, this unique relationship that is war fighting, that is empowered, uh, that, that views themselves as vital members of the joint force. Um, and, and I tell you, over the last five years, our culture has radically changed. The conversations that were happening five years ago, um, which, by the way, were better than the conversations happening five years before that, which were better than the conversations 20 years before that when I first came in, uh, but the conversations in our, in our units is, has substantively changed. It is all threat-informed and threat-focused, and it's, it's all now realizing what we have left to do to continue to improve that warfighting focus. Well, one other additional item about uh, culture is uh, we actually are very self-reflective about culture, and that's a good thing, uh, but I, I don't want us to be obsessed about it either. Uh, we need to, to, to be worried about what's the next right thing we all should be doing uh, to get after uh, our operations relative to the threat, and I believe over time uh, our culture will continue to develop in, in a positive direction, and so I'm very optimistic about where we're headed right now. Thank you, sir. The Space Force Commands Space Operations Command, the Space Systems Command, and STARCOM each have unique missions. Those missions are deeply integrated. What formal feedback mechanisms will Spock use to funnel acquisition and sustainment requirements to Space Systems Command and training requirements back to STARCOM? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And of course, right now we have one of the field commands stood up, but we have our brothers and sisters at Space and Missile Systems Center, uh, led by Lieutenant General JT Thompson. And of course, they will evolve into Space Systems Command next year. Um, so even though SSC is not yet stood up, we have a number of touch points uh, with them. Um, so just a, just a few. Um, General Thompson leads a group of, of uh, program executive officers uh, from his organization and other development organizations who support our mission areas. In their meetings, I am the voice of the operator, and then I have an ops working group that pulls together uh, all of our capability inside of Space Force, but also joint elements as well from US Space Command, so that we're representing all of those ops voices. And General JT Thompson welcomes that engagement, and we are key partners at the table. So I'm very excited about that, which has started uh, over the last several months. And then um, the evolution of DevSecOps, or Agile Software Development, has really changed the game for how operators are involved with developers and acquirers. Uh, you can go back and look at some of the challenged massive C2 systems of the past, uh, whether that was uh, the AOC development efforts that the Air Force went through or the um, JMS, uh, JSPOC mission system developments that we went through. And I'll be honest, we've just learned a lot since then. And DevSecOps is a radically different way to develop that software. And it's all about uh, getting operators together with developers and acquirers and truly rapidly, like on the scale of, of uh, single digit months, getting capability out and then rapidly iterating on that and just continually iterating and improving uh, capability. So we're seeing that now starting to pay off in real spades at the CSPOC and other C2 centers. And I'm excited about where that's going to lead us uh, and, and how we can continue to expand and evolve that going forward. Now, STARCOM does not exist yet, Space Training and Readiness Command. Right now, they are a, a delta, 
uh, and they're a part of SPOC and will be until next year when they get stood up. So uh, selfishly right now, we have a very rapid OODA loop with them. We're all together and uh, Colonel Flores is in all of our meetings. Uh, as STARCOM stands up, we will have to sustain and build those processes. I'm confident we can do that. I can't yet talk with great specificity uh, spe specificity about that, excuse me, uh, because they're not stood up yet, but that'll be a key part of the uh, stand-up effort uh, uh, over the next several months. Great, thank you, sir. And you, you talked in your opening comments about the digitization of the Space Force. How has that contributed? And, and you talk a little bit about DevSecOps as well. Uh, and, and of course, with the newly formed SpaceWorks that stood up last week, can you tell, tell the audience a little bit about how that's gonna evolve into you know rapid capability development to support your your missions yeah we're really excited about where this is going and there's multiple lines of effort under the really inspired leadership of major general kim Kreider, our chief technology and innovation officer on the space force staff in the pentagon uh, but she's charting uh, this vision of of how to uh, raise our digital fluency and then how to start in, in, you know, uh, taking those digital skill sets and those digital tools and applying them across operations, acquisitions, staff work, and, and how do we start to improve all of this. Um, just recently, uh, she has put out uh, some baseline uh, learning paths on a digital learning platform where we all, they've challenged us all in the Space Force to take these uh, learning paths that have to do with agile software development, with, uh, with uh, cyber security, and with a few other um, uh, like big data analytics uh, information areas. I'm halfway through mine, I'm happy to report, and I plan to have that done here before the beginning of the year, uh, but we're all taking these courses to, to raise our game. Um, and then we're looking for opportunities for young operators or Intel professionals or cyber professionals to partner with others to rapidly improve their missions as they're able. Now we have to do that in partnership with uh, Space and Missile Systems Center today and SSC in the future. But just this morning, I took a brief from a young airman in, in our enterprise, and I won't go into all the details here, a senior airman who taught himself to code, he's a space operator, who went in and wrote a new uh, uh, piece of software that has completely improved part of our mission area and has freed up 15% of the manpower of that squadron to be repurposed from kind of rote tasks into higher uh, priority tasks that are more warfighting focused. And that's the kind of innovation uh, that we're looking to unlock with the Digital Space Force effort. Hey, Bill, you're muted, I think, right now. Thank you, sir. I'm okay. learning how this technology, speaking of technology, I'm learning how this stuff works. We can get and you on the you learning paths as well. <laughs> Sir, you spoke about uh, cyberspace and the importance of uh, ensuring that, um, you know, you got your cyber professionals that are part of the space force. And what are the biggest cyber challenges to keeping U.S. military space systems secure in this digitized environment? Well, I tell you, there are so many opportunities in Space Operations Command, but the, the two that I'm most excited about are Space Delta 6, which is our cyber defense and satellite control network Delta, and Space Delta 7, our ISR Delta. I tell you, Space Delta 6 is absolutely getting after it. Now, I mentioned earlier that cyber is our soft underbelly. Of course, there are potential adversaries who are building systems to try to uh, take us on in space. But for most other uh, actors, at least in the near to midterm, uh, trying to deny us through cyber is a much lower barrier to entry. And of course, we are these global networks, um, and, and so we have to defend our mission systems. Now, historically, the military services have spent way more time, effort, and attention on defending their admin networks, the network, uh, the computer network that's on your desk that you do email and PowerPoint on, uh, or some of the classified networks. And that's important. And I am not saying it's not important, but we have to defend our mission networks. So our satellite control network, our GPS, all of our various satellite constellations. And so we in the Space Force are building and have brought in a cyber workforce for exactly that purpose, to develop cyber defenses, not to run installation information technology. And so that Space Delta Six is absolutely getting after that through the development of mission defense teams and uh, through the development of other structures uh, and improved training uh, that will help us uh, to defend those networks. Now, there's more work to do. This will truly be a journey, not a sprint. 
Uh, but I'm excited that we're better today than we were yesterday. And each and every day we're gonna get better and get better at a rapidly improving pace. So it's absolutely vital that those cyber operators uh, spend their entire career thinking about space systems and they do it with intelligence from our uh, Space Force Intel professionals and uh, tightly partnered with our space operators. And that's what's happening. And that's why I'm so excited about this opportunity. Thank you, sir. You talk about uh, workforce development from a cyber perspective, which is critical. Sir, you were at a roundtable discussion with Congressman Lamborn here uh, last month here in Colorado Springs at the U.S. Air Force Academy. And one of the key issues is how to ensure that we develop the space professionals you need to carry out those critical tasks. And I know there's a, a tremendous opportunity there uh, and currently a challenge because if you looked on LinkedIn, they'll say, you know, five years experience with TSSCI clearance needed right now. So how do we develop, how does industry and, and the civil sector help to develop these space professionals that you're going to need? Well, yeah, that meeting a few weeks ago was, was really important. And it was a good meeting because it brought together, of course, government officials, military officials, <clears throat> education officials, not just from the Air Force Academy, but from uh, several of the universities and community colleges here in the Pikes Peak region. It brought together industry. And I think that's kind of what it's going to take here is a, is a whole of community uh, approach. Of course, we're a massive country, 330 million Americans. I, I certainly hope we can produce the workforce that's needed. And I expect we can produce that workforce. Uh, we do need it to be you know, STEM cognizant. We need it to be able to get those security clearances. We need them to come uh, with some baseline knowledge so that when they show up, uh, they are uh, ready to uh, get right to work. And I think if we think about it, that opens up a number of opportunities. Of course, on the military side, we have our National Security Space Institute that uh, provides baseline training. We have our, our training squadron out of Vandenberg that trains our new operators. Uh, we have uh, at various points in your career, you go back for professional military education. I think on the commercial side, uh, you know, how do we do that collectively? I don't know the answer to that, but, but how do we uh, bring in new workers, give them the, the training that they need, maybe some type of certification, and, uh, and then they're ready to show up uh, for work. I think those are all really interesting concepts that, uh, that the uh, attendees at that meeting were wrestling with, and I'm excited to see where that might go in the future. Yes, sir. And, and that's exactly what uh, SFA is looking at as well, is how can we create that community infrastructure so that we can continue to provide those credentialed space professionals to support the Space Force. Uh, so moving on, though it's not the specific role of the Space Operations Command, what outreach opportunities would you like to see your units offering to future space leaders at the U.S. Air Force Academy and even at the Reserve Officer Training Corps cadets at the detachments nationwide to inspire and educate these future leaders to consider commissioning into the Space Force? Yeah, that question is specific to what do I want my units to do, but let me talk more broadly about what the service is doing, because that's really where the, um, you know, where we're really going to have our best payoff. But at the Air Force Academy, we've now assigned a, a colonel space operator who has previous experience being assigned at the Air Force Academy uh, to run our Space Force office there. And he is working across the Air Force Academy with the senior leadership of the Academy uh, to really folk, you know, help focus uh, what it is the Academy is doing for Space Force. And by the way, you go back to the previous uh, Superintendent Lieutenant General Severia and today's uh, Superintendent Lieutenant General Clark, they are excited about this. They are moving out quickly and uh, we are really excited as well. In fact, we just went through a process where the, the two degrees, that's the juniors at the Air Force Academy, who are now thinking about their um, what, what career fields they'll go into when they graduate in the summer of 22. So they're about a year and a half out. We just interviewed um, uh, all of the cadets who were interested in coming to Space Force, uh, they had to sit through an interview with the general officer, and that interview results will go into the selection process because there was more interest than we have slots. So we're excited about that and uh, really appreciate all the Air Force Academy is doing. ROTC is a little bit of a harder uh, beast for us because there's, I think, well over 100 detachments around the, the, uh, the country. Uh, it's unlikely that given the size of U.S. Space Force that we'll be able to put a Space Force person at each of those. So how do we uh, figure out how to use what, you know, the people we have uh, to get the best effect? Because ROTC is absolutely vital to us. It's a great program getting uh, all those uh, students from uh, all these various 
different uh, academic institutions that have specialties, um, uh, some of which are focused on, on the, those diverse populations and doing a fantastic job of giving them STEM educations. And so how do we focus on all the right schools to bring a diverse and STEM cognizant workforce to us? That work's ongoing um, and, we're, and may, maybe some exciting announcements in the near future. Um, same with OTS, uh, figuring out how to partner there and how do we shape the, the selection boards before people go to OTS so that they know they're coming to the Space Force. All that work is ongoing. And, and when we can, we'd love to bring them out to our units and let them see a young operator and say, hey, I wanna be like her or I wanna be like him and be the next generation of space warfighters. Thank you, sir. I remember, uh, remember when we first learned about space or at least I remember learning about space and it was the hula hoop and the globe <laughs> that we would look at in the classroom. What are, what are, what are you doing, sir, specifically to try to help visualize uh, space operations for that training so that people understand what the impact to operations are if space superiority is lost. Uh, we still use some hula hoops, we still <laughs> use some wooden globes and they have their value, uh, but we really are trying to use uh, more modern technology to provide that three-dimensional uh, visualization of the battle space and our squadron that's in the space training and readiness delta the 532nd training squadron, uh, uh, 533rd, pardon me, out at uh, Vandenberg uh, is doing some really interesting things in that space to include some virtual reality that I've had a chance to, to go out and test. But by the way, pro tip, always be cautious when you put on virtual reality headsets and they start taking pictures of you. Those pictures do not turn out well. Uh, but it's really cool when you put those uh, goggles on and you get a chance to hey, I want to know more about what it's like to do a delta V at, uh, at geosynchronous orbit. Well, now you can project yourself onto that orbit and watch exactly how that delta V uh, unfolds relative maybe to another spacecraft. So we're doing a lot of that uh, as well. Now, from our perspective at Spock, what I'm most interested in is giving uh, our operators on their ops floors better situational awareness tools uh, so that they can understand the battle space within which they operate. Of course, our battle space is one that today we, we interact with through a computer screen. And so we want to give them the tools to understand how the actions that they're taking um, uh, through that computer screen is playing out on orbit and what that means for them. And, and I, I tell you, we think there's some real opportunities there with some relatively small dollar innovation projects through those DevSecOps opportunities I was talking about earlier to, to help give us those tools. Thank you, sir. The Space Force Association provides an independent voice for space professionals to contribute their thoughts and research on issues relevant to the Space Force. What topics are you interested in hearing about in the content we develop for our international audience? Well, you know, we think uh, anytime there's a robust dialogue on space uh, in the nation, that is a good thing. And of course, we have definitely seen that over the last couple of years. Um, and and that's played out in many ways. Uh, it's played out in the political sphere through the passing of the National Defense Authorization Act that stood up the Space Force. It's played out through the creation of the uh, US Space Command. Yeah, it's played out on Netflix with uh, the Space Force uh, show and uh, I guess season two is upcoming. So we have that to look forward to. But you know, when space is on people's mind, uh, that's a good thing. And so to the extent that SFA can foster that uh, conversation, helping, to un helping the American people to understand what space uh, brings for them. I remember in the way back, uh, there used to be a public service announcement. I think it was Jesse Jackson and it was Barry Goldwater, uh, people who I think would self-describe on different ends of the political sphere, but it was a public service announcement about how, how space technologies and technologies developed for space purposes uh, played such a positive role in people's lives. And I think, uh, I think that's a conversation we need to continue to have so that the American people understand uh, the importance of uh, ensuring that the United States continues to have access to space when and where we need it for whatever purpose we need it. And, uh, and as I think the American people become more educated about that, uh, it'll inspire uh, those who uh, want to pursue uh, careers in, in space. And I, and I think it'll open their eyes to the uh, reason that we've created these new defense structures in space that we have over the last 15 or 16 months. Uh, thank you, sir. And we will do that. If you don't know, we are starting the Space Force Journal, which is a peer-reviewed journal to allow continued dialogue and let folks have a voice uh, to ensure that all these topics that we talk about get codified and documented so we can continue to elevate that discussion. And so, yes, sir, we are tracking and we will execute. Sir, a couple of quick questions. One is from Sandra Irwin from the audience here. 
And she is asking, as you come up on the one year anniversary, what are some Space Force accomplishments that a year ago you didn't think could be accomplished? And what are some key goals for year number two? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, if you had told me on the 20th of December last year, and remember when the NDAA came out, uh, it was a bit surprising to us that we stood up Space Force upon enactment of that uh, bill. The legislative proposal that had gone over from the Department of Defense, I think, was going to give us 18 months to plan and then stand up after the bill was signed. So we were stood up right away. If you had said that within about seven months, we would have done two things. One, and in no particular order, uh, one, created our first capstone doctrine document. Uh, I, I would have said that's going to be a tall order. Uh, but because of some great bottoms up work uh, from some of our Space Force professionals, civilian officer enlisted, and uh, an Army person, uh, Army space operator per, uh, participated in that. And by the way, Bill, that you should go to all of them and ask them to write articles for you. Uh, but I, I think anyone in the DOD would have thought that was a bit uh, fast, uh, faster than it should have been expected. So we did that. In about that same timeline, we stood up all of our new uh, organizational structures at the tactical level. We transformed our three wings here in Colorado into eight space deltas. Uh, we've uh, stood up the two garrisons that oversee the bases here in Colorado, and we brought in uh, over 20 units from Air Education and Training Command, Air Combat Command, the Air Force Operational Test and Evaluation Center to stand up uh, Star Delta, Space Training and Readiness Delta. And yes, that's an organizational answer, but it's also about how we operate. So now those Space Delta commanders are solely focused on a particular mission area, and they are responsible for that mission area. And it gives us, for the first time, a complete uh, leadership focus on a singular space mission area. And I think our joint uh, teammates are seeing the advantages of that as well. Similarly, our installation or garrison commanders now have a singular focus on preparing those warfighting platforms from which we execute our operations. And they're not, uh, their time's not being divided by other concerns. So not only was that a really you know, fast organizational change, but it also has changed how we operate within the Space Operations Command. So those are two that I would point to. This next year, uh, for things that we have to get done, we have to get the, uh, our, our uh, two additional field commands stood up. And so you've seen a lot of press recently about Sp Space and Missile Systems Center transforming into Space Systems Command. Uh, and then the work that we're leading right now here at SPOC is the, is the planning for that Space Training and Readiness Command, or Starcom that will birth out of Spock at some point uh, next year, and uh, that will be vital for us because that is all about how do we develop the space warfighter and how do we develop the tactics, techniques, and procedures we need to succeed in in space. And really, that's an area that we never did as well uh, in in the old Air Force Space Command or the Air Force that we should have. And there's new resources coming to that, and it's a really an opportunity for us. And we and I'm really excited about that happening in uh, in 2021. Thank you, sir. Uh, last question, because I know how busy you are. A uh, lot of talk about the reserve component and bringing in the Guard and Reserve. Is, is that something you could uh, just talk about briefly, or, or is that still kind of under review? Well, it is under review, and there's language that'll be in the NDAA if the president signs it uh, that um, we'll talk to that. But let me say this. We cannot execute our mission without our reserve and our guard teammates. And today they remain the Air Force Reserve and the Air National Guard. And we are in no way looking to change that at all. And by that, I mean uh, the partnership uh, that we have with the Reserve and Guard. We will be a total force as we move forward. Now, the question is, what will that Reserve and Guard component look like? That actually requires legislation from the Congress under their constitutional role to write the laws that govern uh, the, the military services. And so there is a study uh, that has been ongoing, and I think we'll see if this NDA is signed, another study being rec uh, directed um, that will ultimately result in congressional, uh, congressional proposal going from the uh, Department of Defense uh, through the appropriate channels. And then the Congress uh, will ultimately write the law that will... Uh, will stand up um, or make any changes to the, uh, the reserve and the guard. Uh, so we'll have to see how that plays out. But all I can tell you is we are utterly dependent on them now. They are fantastic warfighters, and we will continue to be dependent on them as we move forward. Thank you, sir. I don't know if you got it or not. I, I dropped a uh, gift by your desk a few weeks ago. It's a uh, face mask with the SFA logo on it. Did you receive that, sir? I, I did receive it. I did not bring it into the room with me. I should have done that. No, understand, sir. I probably should have let you know. 
Uh, but thank you so much for your time. It always is a pleasure to speak with you, and, and it really is an honor. And on behalf of our uh, corporate members and all of our individual members of the Space Force Association, uh, happy birthday to the Space Force and Semper Super. Any closing comments, sir? Again, thanks for the opportunity, Bill. It's good to see you uh, after serving with, uh, you know, alongside you for so many years uh, while, while uh, we were both uh, serving in the Air Force. Um, you know, thanks for what this community is doing. Uh, this new uh, organization that's uh, looking to advocate for space and the Space Force, you know, definitely appreciate that. And, um, and I just wish everyone a, a happy holidays uh, as we move through the holidays here. I know a lot of us are getting calls from families that says they can't can't travel or we can't travel because of, of where we're going. So just ask everybody to look after each other out there, uh, but try to enjoy the season. And, uh, and hopefully next year, uh, as the vaccines roll out, we'll, we'll get back to normal. And then we can have some of these uh, meetings face-to-face -face and, and uh, you know, do some, uh, do some socializing around some good food and drink. Yes, sir. Looking forward to it. Thanks again for your time, sir. And have a great Space Force day. Semper Supra. Thanks, everyone. Semper Supra.